This is Pivot Perspectives with Chris O'Byrne, the show that takes you around the world to share interviews with some of the most successful and relevant people on the planet. Hear their stories and get the most important business lessons they've learned on their road to success and get exclusive access on how to implement their success into your life and business. Pivot Perspectives is brought to you by the Strategic Advisor Board and your host, Chris O'Byrne. Mickey Burnham, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. I would like to go back one or two years to your childhood and <laughs> uh, share with us some defining moments that helped shape who you became. Well, I think one of the most defining moments um, came from my parents. You know, I, I was fortunate enough to, to have chosen my parents very well. <laughs> Um, mom and dad were wonderfully supportive and encouraging. And I can remember mom saying to me once when I was just a child, says, Mickey, you're going to be a great man someday. I had no idea what she meant by that, but it's something that I remember even to this day. And it's, it's something that I took to heart. Uh, my mother wouldn't lie to me. And so no matter what it meant, um, I knew that I had a great future ahead of me, and I just needed to believe that and hang on to it and, and try to move towards it. So that, that was one defining moment. Uh, having my parents, someone that I loved and respected, to say something affirming to me and something encouraging at a young age. And it's something that stuck with me and, uh, and still serves me to this day. That is an excellent one. So what was your childhood like in general? Well, I'd venture to say that uh, I came from a privileged uh, childhood, a privileged background, but it's privileged in a different sort of way. It was privileged because um, I had a mother and a father present who loved me and who cared for me and my siblings uh, and who, to a large extent, sheltered us. Uh, and, and so we had a protected um, childhood um, and one that was uh, supportive and encouraging. But I grew up as an African-American male in the uh, southern U.S., grew up in the state of Texas. And um, this was during the 1950s and 60s. And so um, segregation was still the order of the day. And uh, my background uh, took that in, into account, had to, of necessity. And so I've sometimes uh, spoken to folks and talked about uh, having grown up on the wrong side of the tracks, it's the side of the tracks that was uh, separated by railroad tracks. On the one side were the African-American residents of the, of the city and the town. Uh, there was uh, little uh, infrastructure on that side of town. The roads, the streets were not paved. Uh, the school system, et cetera, were underfunded. And therefore, uh, the children and school kids and so forth suffered because of that. Um, but that was, uh, that was the, 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 the period in which we grew up. And those were the circumstances that defined life for African Americans at, uh, at that point in time. And so I grew up on that side of the tracks where we didn't have quite as much um, and we needed to make do essentially with what we had. Um, out of date uh, school books and equipment uh, was one example. Limited opportunities for extracurricular activities. Um, you know, while the school I uh, did have a football and, and had basketball teams, a track team, did not have baseball. And baseball was, uh, was uh, you know, America's game at that point. And so just, just one illustrative example. So then you managed to get to college. And was it difficult for you in coming from that situation to get into college? No, it, it really was not. As, 
as I said, I, I came from what I consider a privileged background. Both my parents were college graduates. In fact, they met at Prairie View. Um, it was Prairie View College at that time, I think. It's Prairie View A&M University now. Uh, and so, though we didn't have a lot from an economic perspective, we had more than the average American did in, in terms of resources and, and so forth. Um, and I grew up with the expectation that college would follow high school because my parents had gone to college. I knew that that's, that I just came to expect that's what one did upon high school graduation. And so uh, my sisters and I grew up with that expectation and all three of us uh, went to college. So what did you go to college for? What was your degree in? And I should say degrees. <laughs> yes. I had uh, taken an economics course. It was a six-week course, I think, uh, in high school, uh, my senior year. And I just fell in love with the subject matter. And uh, at that point, I decided to switch from psychology or counseling which is where I was headed, I think, to that point, and uh, decided to major in economics. So when I went to uh, what was then North Texas State University, um, my uh, chosen major was economics. Uh, I stuck with it and uh, graduated with a the, with the degree in economics, a baccalaureate degree. Decided during that experience that in addition to uh, studying economics, I liked being on a college campus. I liked the academic life. And while both my parents had been teachers at the high school and elementary school level, uh, I decided if I can have a career on a college or university campus, that would be just tremendous. And of course, this was uh, the mid 1960s, late 1960s. And so opportunities were opening up for people of color across the country. And, um, and so it, it seemed quite feasible and possible to pursue a dream like that. And so I decided to become a professor of economics, at least that was my dream. And my um, department chairman at North Texas State said, well, Mickey, if you're gonna become a, a, an economics professor, you need to go to graduate school. And um, he encouraged me to do so. Uh, so I have a baccalaureate degree in economics, a master's degree in economics, and a PhD in economics as well. So you stuck with it the whole time. And then did you start teaching as soon as you got your PhD? I did. I did. Uh, my, my first job actually uh, coming out of graduate school was at uh, Florida State University in Tallahassee. Oh. I was on the economics faculty there and also in the, um, I believe it was called the Social Sciences Institute or the Institute for Social Sciences, as I, as I recall. But spent a few years there before moving on to um, the University of North Carolina system in that office and then uh, very, uh, definitely into higher ed administration. Yeah, so tell me about that journey going into the administrative side. Well, it it was a difficult decision because um, part of the graduate school, the PhD experience, in addition to teaching the subject matter, is to um, acculturate one into the, the field of uh, academic, uh, of, of the academy. And so what one learns to do in a graduate program, in a PhD program, is to do research, to publish papers, and to engage with one's colleagues in the creation of knowledge. And um, uh, academics, um, faculty members, sometimes look down their noses at administrators who are people 
whose jobs primarily are to make sure that the universe is functioning properly, that things get done when they're supposed to get done, and uh, that people are held accountable for doing the things that they're supposed to do and so forth. And when one is doing all of that, it leaves relatively little time for doing the scholarship that, um, that, that, that an academic is expected uh, and has been trained to do. So I, to be honest, I kind of wrestled with that. Um, um, not sure what to do, but opportunities came along and I decided that the opportunities that uh, I received were unusual. That is that they probably would not come along again if I passed them up. And, and so I made the difficult decision to make that, uh, to make that jump or that change. And I, I don't regret it. It worked out well for me. So you became a paper pusher. <laughs> <laughs> and, yep. more. and more. Yeah. So now begins the journey that really leads to where you're at now. But you have a long career in uh, academic administration. Um, it would probably take the whole show just to go through all the, the places where you've served. But what was it? The, what was the overall arc of your administrative journey? Uh, well, really, until you retired. Well, I <clears throat> focus largely on service. How do I make a difference with the time that I have on this on this earth? And um, I thought that through my efforts in helping to shape universities helping to um, develop policies and procedures and doing so in a way that enhance the experiences of others could make a real difference. And by others, I'm thinking first of students. What can I do as a university administrator, as a provost or a vice chancellor, or as a chancellor or president to make this journey uh, a productive one and an enjoyable one for students. And so that was always uh, at the top of my list of priorities and concerns. What would be in the best interest of students? In addition to that, um, a university is a place not just for students, but for faculty and for staff as well. You want them to have a good experience. You want them to feel that they are being productive and to feel that their work environment is a place that they enjoy and, and want, to, want to be in. And so um, my, my focus was on doing what I could to add to that in a way that uh, helped people be productive and to move forward. And so how many years did you spend in leadership? <laughs> well, I spent four and a half years as um, an assistant vice president for the University of North Carolina system. I spent nine years as provost at North Carolina Central. That's 13 and a half years. Then I spent 11 years at Elizabeth City State University as chancellor. So that's 24 and a half years. And then 11 years at Bowie State University. And what's that, 30, 35 years? 35. Plus, uh, there were one, two, a couple of years after I retired. Uh, that made 37 years of administration. So that's, uh, that, that is a career. It is a handful and a half for <laughs> sure. So then once you retired, you didn't retire. You became an executive coach. And who do you primarily help? As an executive coach, I work with leaders, primarily academic leaders, persons who are at the level of uh, dean or vice president 
or president or chancellor. Um, but I've also been blessed to be able to work with leaders um, in the spiritual realm or the religious realm, churches, church leaders. I have coached several senior pastors. Um, it turns out that leadership has a lot of commonalities, no matter what particular industry or discipline. Uh, and so uh, it always involves people and people and those interactions lead to certain uh, outcomes or expectations that uh, are common across, across industries. And so um, my own approach uh, tends to be spiritually based. And so um, through circumstances, uh, I have been led to uh, an opportunity to serve some spiritual leaders, church leaders. Uh, it must be very satisfying um, because, well, it, it actually that it becomes a good segue into your book, which is Leading by Serving, which has been really your life's mission and your life's experience. So tell me about the book Leading by Serving and what's in there? What can people get from that book? Well, uh, I had a great deal of fun writing it. And so I just hope that uh, people uh, will will decide that it, it's a, a fun read, an interesting read as well. Um, but what I uh, what I have included, I think, is just the opportunity to tell my story of of what leadership has meant for me, uh, with without trying to force it on other people. I, I wanted to share my perspective, to share some stories from my experience of those 40 plus years, and to let the reader get out of that what he or she thinks it's speaking to them. And so it's a book that's intended to, I hope it um, entertains, I hope that it provides some instruction, at least it will share with the reader leadership approaches to situations and circumstances that worked for me. Uh, and um, perhaps it will also be inspirational. We'll share some things that folks who are beginning leadership careers or who are contemplating leadership careers might not have thought about. And so it might help them get off to a better start than they would uh, would otherwise. So the book is ideal for really a servant leader who is looking to improve their what they do and how their they serve. Their effectiveness as leaders, yes. Yes. So what are some of those uh, leadership approaches that you bring up uh, in the book? Well, the first thing I do is to emphasize that uh, leadership these days in complex organizations, effective leadership is really about team leadership. So it's not just the individual who holds the leadership title, but it's the effectiveness of the entire leadership team. And so uh, that is one of the points that I learned um, during my um, experiences and one that I try to share through stories um, with the readers. Um, there, there are several others. You know, one of the, there are many attributes, I think, of an effective leader, but one of the most critical, in my view, is having integrity. Mm -hmm. Integrity is a core component of good character and in order for one to be an effective leader, I think that person has to be seen as having integrity um, um, and applying that in his or her life and letting that sort of serve as the cornerstone of effective leadership. Leadership, in my view, quite simply is having an impact that is um, causing others to do something that they would not have done otherwise. And you see from that, um, 
one can cause others to do things that we might not consider to be good. Uh, and so leadership in and of itself can be what I call good or it can be bad. And so when I speak about it, I'm thinking about leadership that has an impact on people for their good and for the good of those that the organizations that they're working in were intended to serve. So good leadership uh, means um, moving people to a point where they do take some action that they would not have taken otherwise and that it benefits um, others. How do you define integrity? Hmm. Good question. Good question. Um, on the simplest level, one can say that uh, integrity is doing what one says he's going to do. It means um, making sure that um, what one says and what one does are consistent and that they mesh with each other. Um, I found that <clears throat> what speaks loudest, what has the greatest impact on those who would be followers is what they see the leader doing as opposed to what they hear the leader saying. And so integrity comes when what that leader says is the same thing as what that leader does and demonstrates. And so the consistency there is what I think leads one to have the influence and effect on people so that they will want to follow uh, in, in doing something. So for the person who struggles with that consistency between what they say and what they do, do you have any suggestions for how they can improve their integrity? Mm. Well, uh, I think so. I would urge uh, your listeners and viewers to, to buy the book and to read it because in several of the, of the stories that I tell there, I think they point to just the answer to that question. Um, you know, what, what a leader needs, in my view, is, uh, is a North Star. Uh, something that uh, will help that person decide what is right <laughs> and what is wrong. And um, it's not the same for everybody. And uh, there are some people who are in positions to influence others by virtue of their position, um, but they are very inconsistent and um, their words and their actions or do not mesh. Uh, and so I think the, in, in some instances, that points to the lack of a North Star, uh, the lack of some moral compass or guiding light that one can always look to in deciding what is right and what is wrong in this situation, and then uh, trying to influence people to move and in the direction that that is right. Um, th that's something that leaders have to deal with very often. Uh, and that I think is the essence of the leadership challenge. But sometimes the decision is not between what is right and what is wrong. Sometimes the decision is between what is right and what is right. Uh, that's when things really get tough. And there again, uh, I think the North Star, as I've chosen to call it, could be very helpful. Part of that North Star speaks, uh, has to do with the organization that one's serving in. Okay, if it's a university, you know, what's the mission of that university? Uh, what uh, vision has the board or the head of the system, if it's in a system, uh, what vision has been shared. And so you make decisions in a way that's consistent with that vision, consistent with that mission, 
uh, and and the direction that the board uh, are the are are your leader uh, has yeah. expressed for the organization. Um, but but again, I, I I think that some of the stories that I that I share in the book will will highlight that and and at least give the reader something to think about. So shifting gears a little bit, who have been some important mentors or influences in your life? Mm. Mm. That's a good, that's a good question. Well, I started uh, this interview by talking about my, my parents and I would have to list them. Um, you know, mom and dad were always there. They helped shape how I saw the world. Um, they uh, had great control over my early experiences during my formative years. And so uh, through those, they had a great impact on who I have become. I like to think that I am who I am today in part because I have engaged in a lot of self-reflection and learn from what I've experienced. But uh, I would have to list my parents uh, you know, first as, as mentors and persons who influenced me. I've always been a reader and have um, enjoyed, I think, benefiting from people who were about serving others and about making a difference. A lot of people speak of Martin Luther King Jr. and you know he gave his life for other for for folks for for people for African Americans for the United States of America. And so uh, the courage that he showed in the face of danger, the faith that he showed uh, in his interactions with other people, often hostile. Um, it was really impactful uh, on me as well. I've had wonderful academic leaders. The chairperson of the Department of Economics at uh, North Texas State University uh, had an impact on me. I saw through him what excellence was and um, how uh, he approached leadership at the departmental level uh, back at North Texas State. I had the privilege of, of uh, working for great guys um, when I was provost at North Carolina Central University. One of those uh, leaders was uh, uh, Dr. Terunza Richmond, who hired me as provost. I saw how uh, he prided himself on not becoming angry and not letting uh, people find the buttons to touch in him that would cause him to lose control. Um, and uh, he had a gift for letting insults or letting challenges roll off his back. I think I've taken a little bit of that from him. I had another leader at North Carolina Central University, um, Julius Chambers, who was a lawyer by training, but who had just a, an overriding passion for poor people and for disadvantaged people. So he had a distinguished career as a civil rights attorney. Um, when he that was that was always what he was about. You know that was his north star. I would venture to say, you know, serving people who are disadvantaged. Who don't, who can't effectively serve themselves in our legal system that sort of defines everything in this country, and being their advocate. Um, and so I think all of those persons have had an impact on me and have helped shape who who I who I've become. But but there are others as well. But those are the ones who come most readily to mind. It's a good list. So. As we wrap things up, what are some parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share? Well, I think the most effective leadership is really 
leadership that is focused on serving other people. It does not look inward towards what uh, perks and what opportunities it can afford the individual, but it looks to how it can make the lives of other people better. And so leading through serving, I think is really what uh, not only makes a difference, but what also gives one a great deal of um, personal satisfaction and accomplishment. Those are great. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the uh, show with me and the interview. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of wisdom in what you shared. I'm excited for people to buy your book, Leading by Serving, which is already out there and available. And uh, are, is there any place else that you'd like people to go to learn more about you? Well, um, I think there will do it. I, if, if one just goes uh, to Google and, and, and does a search on my name, <laughs> a lot will come up uh, because I've, I've been in the, in the public eye for, for a career. Uh, and so uh, there will be a, a lot of pictures and uh, descriptions of uh, some things that I've been involved in, et cetera, which, which could give a little bit more insight. But I, I think the stories of the book probably will do the best job. Well, I'll make sure that the um, link to the book is in the show notes for this. All right. And thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Pivot Perspectives with your host, Chris O'Byrne. Please leave your feedback and visit strategicadvisorboard.com to get the latest and greatest business advice on the planet. Follow us on social media for updates, and we will see you on the next episode.